Welcome and thank you for standing by. Currently all participants in our listen only mode. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted publicly. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn the call over to your host for today, Jewel Jordan. Thank you so much, Lisa. And good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the Journalists in American Community Survey webinar. We're gonna be focusing on educating you on the Census Bureau um, and what we, resources we have available to you all as journalists, as well as the American Community Survey in today's webinar. The webinar is going to be recorded as Lisa mentioned and materials from the webinar are gonna be available through the Census Academy. You can follow the link on this uh, slide to get to those materials. If you are in need of a closed captioning, you can click on the CC button in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. And before I proceed, I'd really like to thank all of the American Community Survey respondents for their participation in the survey. Without them, we wouldn't have data, and which is so important for America's communities. Once again, thank you all for joining today's webinar. Um, I will be giving some, addition, some original slides um, to talk about the Census Bureau and our public information office. Uh, then the webinar will be led by Ryan Ricciardi, a survey statistician with the American Community Survey Office, and he'll be providing you all with an overview of the ACS. Uh, then we'll also have Dante Cheney, a data journalist with the Wall Street Journal and NBC News. He's also the co-founder of the American Communities Project, and he'll be going over how ACS and other federal data can be used to help tell your stories. Once again, my name is Jewel Jordan. I'm a public affairs specialist at the Census Bureau with the Public Information Office. I'll now provide you all with a very brief overview of the Census Bureau, as well as our PIO and the assistance that we can provide you. Uh, so first, I'd like to give you all a bit of a basic Census Bureau overview, a little bit about who we are and what we do. The Census Bureau is a lot more than just a decennial census. Between decennial census years, we actually uh, conduct over 100 different household surveys and programs, and they cover a variety of topics, um, including the ACS, but we also cover things like the current population survey, um, the household pulse survey, those kinds of things. Um, one of the surveys that we are gonna focus on today, or rather the focus of today's webinar is the American Community Survey, and Ryan will give you a much more in-depth overview of that particular survey. But from the many surveys and programs that we produce, uh, we actually produce, it, it, or sorry, could conduct, we produce an extensive uh, amount of household and economic data that helps to provide measures of the nation's people, places, and economy annually. If you'd like to learn more about the various surveys and about what the Census Bureau does between decennial census years, I'd strongly suggest that you follow the links on these slides. Now I'd like to give you a little bit of information about the Public Information Office or PIO. Um, PIO's mission is to serve as a liaison between the Census Bureau and members of the media like you. Our services include preparing news releases and announcements um, for news organizations and conducting, or sorry, connecting journalists to our Census Bureau subject matter experts for interviews and for information to support your news stories. So if there's ever anything that you need, you can reach out to us and we'll be happy to lend you a hand and make sure that you're getting the information that you need to be able to tell your stories. We also offer trainings for journalists in newsrooms, similar to the webinar that we're gonna be doing today, um, but we can actually create uh, customized trainings to cover various topics um, that'll cover a lot more surveys so that you know exactly what we have to offer. And we offer that to you all as journalists in, uh, to your newsrooms free of charge. Next, I'll be talking about the newsroom. So I've got quite a bit to go through here, um, but I wanna make sure that you all have a thorough understanding of what's on offer in our newsroom. Um, to access the Census Bureau's newsroom, first you'll need to go to census.gov, then you'll go to the top of the page and click on news, and that'll take you to our newsroom landing page. From the newsroom landing page, you can access just about everything that we have to offer, um, starting with our blogs. There are actually four different platforms for blogs that we offer, and they give you a first person uh, account from our different program areas. So within our director's blog, you can hear from our directors going all the way back to 2009. The most recent director is Robert L. Santos. Um, so you can hear from him and his thoughts on what we're, we've been working on. Then if you're looking for a deeper dive into our data, you can uh, hear directly from our subject matter experts in our random samplings blogs, where they describe the work that they're doing and explain our different statistics. 
Then there's the Research Matters blogs, which offer a deeper dive from our scientists and research areas that go into the different survey methodologies and confidentiality when it comes to handling our data. And last but certainly not least of our blogs, we have the Global Reach blog, which provides information on foreign trade data and trade regulations and import and export statistics. Then we've got our Facts for Features. The Facts for Features are collections of data highlights from the Census Bureau that help to um, highlight the diversity of America and the population as it changes. And the Facts for Features coordinate with different observance months, holidays, anniversaries, and topics. So you might see things there for Asian American History Month, Black History Month. Uh, we have an upcoming Facts for Features for the um, anniversary of Americans with disabilities. That's the kind of thing that you'll find within the Facts for Features. And then we have our electronic press kits. Electronic press kits are collections of uh, all of the related news products to certain topics and or releases. They provide a deeper dive into our data releases and provide you with a detailed list of all of the products that are related. So that could be um, news releases, tip sheets, fact sheets, graphics, any resources that are related to a particular release. Then there is the actual press release section, and the press release section contains every single news product that we've released. Um, so if a product might be featured in a press kit, you can also find it by itself in the news re uh, releases area. Starting within the news releases, news products area, so under press releases, you can also find our embargoed news releases. Embargoed re news releases are available only for accredited members of the media um, who have signed up for embargo access. Our up next upcoming embargoed release is actually going to be the release of the 2022 American Community Survey one-year estimates, and those are scheduled to go on embargo on September 12th for public release on September 14th. So it's a two-day advance for you all as members of the media to uh, be able to write, to look at the data and write your stories, uh, maybe do an interview or two during that period and prep so that it's ready to go first thing on the 14th. Then we have our stats for stories. The stats for stories provide links to timely story day ideas highlighting the Census Bureau's different newsworthy statistics. Um, and these can relate to different current events, observances, holidays, and anniversaries. They're very similar to facts for features, but they've got uh, links rather than little data nuggets in them. So you can explore them and use those to help uh, jump off any stories that you might be thinking of. And then last in the newsroom, you'll also find our tip sheets. Tip sheets give you a sense of what's coming up every two weeks um, and what we've recently released. The tip sheets contain reports, data sets, and other products tentatively scheduled for release within the next four weeks. So they're about a month out. Um, you can use this to help plan your stories and know what's coming up. And we update these regularly every two weeks. Um, and also in our newsroom, you can actually subscribe to our email updates, um, and they're available to you by areas of interest as well as by product. So if you're interested in receiving the biweekly tip sheet when it goes out every two weeks, you can subscribe to that. Or if there's a specific topic area of data that you're interested in, you can subscribe to all of the products that are related to that particular topic. Um, if you ever have a question or are in need of data assistance and would like to conduct an interview with one of our subject matter experts, you're absolutely welcome to reach out to the Public Information Office, and you can contact us by email at PIO at census.gov or by phone at 301-763-3030, and someone from our office will get back to you and help you get the information that you need. One more source um, that you might want to keep in mind is the America Counts. America Counts is um, a, it's a page that can be found under our resource library tab. Um, and this is a collection of stories that have been written by subject matter experts here at the Census Bureau that help to give real world uh, application and context to the data that we produce. So I'm sure you all as journalists can appreciate that. So we've taken a stab at writing the stories ourselves um, and they can be used as a reference point for you all as well. One of the most important things for us here at the Census Bureau is data equity. We're committed to producing data that depict an accurate portrait of America, including our underserved communities. Some of the ways that data equity um, is covered in our different services is through our demographic data. We provide a wealth of data by key demographic variables such as race, ethnicity, sex, disability, income, and veteran status to help measure equity. Um, and these data are often available by different levels of geography, uh, which means that they can help provide 
local, they can provide context at a local level for the data that we produce. We also provide public assistance program metrics. Um, among other uses, the Census Bureau data can provide metrics to show public assistance programs progress and outcomes. We also have diversity measures. We use several different approaches when it comes to measuring the racial and ethnic diversity of the U.S., um, and that's going to include the diversity index, prevalence rankings, the diffusion score, and series of uh, prevalence maps. Then we focus on data education. Um, a major part of our mission is to educate the public, policymakers, and stakeholders on what data we have available and how you can use them. So just as we're doing this webinar for you all today, we make sure that we reach out to other relevant parties um, that to make sure that they have the latest and greatest data that's available to them and that they know how to use it. We also seek to empower our data users to, uh, with understandable, accurate, and timely information and the knowledge on how they can use it. And we also have various data tools. The data tools that we have offer public uh, policy makers uh, to help understand the issues surrounding inequities and able to them to propose effective database solutions um, or different database solutions. I actually have a few uh, of the tools that I can go through really quickly for you all. One of the tools that we have is the Community Resilience Estimates or the CRE. Um, the CRE has the cap capacity uh, of individuals and households within a community to absorb the external stresses of a disaster. So it's essentially a measure of how vulnerable a neighborhood or a group um, is to natural disasters. The CRE for equity data sets provides information about the nation, states, counties, and census tracts from the Community Resilience Estimates, the American Community Survey, and the Census Bureau's planning database. So it combines data from several different sources. Then we have the Response Outreach Mapper, or ROAM. This application was developed to make it easier to identify hard to survey areas, um, and also to provide a socioeconomic and demographic characteristics profile of these areas using ACS estimates. Then we have the Opportunity Atlas, and the Opportunity Atlas helps you to answer questions like, which neighborhoods in America offer uh, the best chance for children to rise out of poverty? Um, and it uses anonymous data following different uh, 20 million Americans from childhood to their mid 30s. So we have a bunch of different tools that are available to you all to use to help with telling your stories and that cover various different topics and help to tell the story of the diversity of the, of the nation. Um, now though, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Ryan and he'll tell you about the American Community Survey. Thank you to all. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ryan Rashardi, and today I will introduce you to the ACS. I'll explain how the data are collected, the topics included, and the geographies covered. Then I will go over various ACS data products you can access. I'll explain how ACS data can be useful to journalists' news stories, and I'll conclude by providing you with resources for learning more about the ACS. So, what do all these headlines have in common? They all belong to news stories written using ACS data. When the 2021 ACS one-year estimates were released in September of last year, many news outlets reported on the demographic, social, economic, and housing changes that happened during the pandemic. For example, you learn from the ACS that between 2019 and 2021, the number of Americans working from home tripled, the median home value increased from about $240,000 to about $281,000, and that the percentage of people with health insurance nudged up slightly. And that's just national statistics. With ACS data, you can drill down to smaller geographies like state, county, congressional district, census tract, and more. The ACS can power your news stories. It can provide you with a quantitative dimension to a wide variety of demographic, social, economic, and housing trends happening across the country in geographies big and small. And with that, let's get started. So the ACS is a household survey. It is the nation's most current, reliable, and accessible data source for local statistics on critical planning topics. 
The survey samples approximately 3.5 million addresses each year. These data are collected continuously throughout the year to produce annual social, economic, housing, and demographic estimates. The data collected through ACS help inform how trillions of dollars in federal funds are distributed each year. Our estimates cover more than 40 topics and support more than 300 known federal uses and countless non-federal uses. The Census Bureau typically releases three different sets of data estimates from the ACS each year in the form of one-year and five-year period data sets, as well as one-year supplemental estimates. And I will discuss these data products in more detail on an upcoming slide. So the content collected by the American Community Survey can be grouped into four main types of characteristics, social, demographic, economic, and housing. So taking a closer look at the type of each of these uh, categories contain, type of information each of these categories contain, um, on the left here, you have social characteristics, and that includes topics such as disability status, educational attainment, and language spoken at home. The ACS also collects basic demographic characteristics like sex, age, race, and Hispanic origin. Economic characteristics will include such topics as commuting to work, employment status, and income. And lastly, housing characteristics includes topics such as computer and internet use, housing costs, and vehicles available. And so the tables, uh, the, I'm sorry, the topics used, these topics are used to produce more than 1,000 tables for local communities each year. And so along with the numerous topics covered, the ACS also provides data for more geographies on an annual basis than any other household survey. There are over 13,000 geographies for one-year estimates, 15,000 geographies for one-year supplemental estimates, and 776,000 geographies for the five-year estimates. The image on this slide shows some of the geographies for which ACS data are produced and the relationship between them. So the lower geographic areas will fit neatly within the larger areas directly connected with lines. So as you can see, for example, the school, congressional, and state legislative districts will fit neatly within states and will not cross state boundaries. However, they may cross uh, boundaries of counties or metropolitan areas. And also you can see in this visualization that the smallest geographic building block is the block group. The ACS has a broad appeal because of the vast number of available geographies. So covering a wide range of geographic areas, ACS data are most commonly needed at the state, county, place, census tract, and block group levels. And this slide illustrates the relationship between these common geographic types and how they are nested within one another, as this example shows in El Paso, Texas. So census tracts are small statistical subdivisions within a county that contain about um, between 1,200 and 8,000 people. Block groups are a group of census blocks within a census tract, and those contain roughly between 600 and 3,000 people, and which you can see enlarged in the right corner of the screen. So again, the ACS has the ability to report on a wide range of geographies, as well as to provide data at very granular levels like census tracts and block groups. Now, ACS data products are released about one year after the data are collected. So ACS data are generally re released in September, the calendar year after collection, as one-year estimates, in October, the calendar year after collection, as one-year supplemental estimates, and five-year estimates are generally released in December, the calendar year after collection. So for example, the uh, one-year ACS data collected from January 1st through December 31st of 2021 were released in September of 2022. Um, ACS one-year estimates, they combine uh, data collected over 12 months and are available for geographic areas with a population of 65,000 or more. The one-year supplemental estimates are a subset of detail tables and they're available for geographic areas with populations of 20,000 or more. And lastly, ACS five-year estimates combine data collected over 60 months, and they're available for geographic areas of all sizes. 
down to very small geographies like census tracts and block groups. And so the release dates for these three sets of data products are shown on this slide. And the full detailed data release schedule is available at the link you see at the bottom of the screen. So broadly speaking, the data products are either profiles or tables. And the, letter in the letters in parentheses next to the profile and table types as you can see on this slide and the next slide, correspond to the beginning of the table ID. So data profiles begin with the letters DP and comparison profiles begin with the letters CP. And selected population profiles always have the same code and that is S0201. Now ACS uh, includes the um, a, little, a little explanation of, the, of the, those three types of uh, of products. So the data profiles provide broad social, economic, housing, and demographic profiles. Comparison profiles offer comparisons of data profiles um, across ACS years. And selected, lastly, se selected population profiles provide uh, broad social, economic, and housing profiles for a large number of race, ethnic, um, ancestry, and country or region of birth groups. And so the image on this uh, slide here on the right, it's an example of a data profile. Uh, more specifically, it is data profile for selected housing characteristics. And this profile contains a variety of useful housing data, like the year structure was built, the number of vehicles available, and home heating fuel. This profile is available for geographies big and small across the US. And other than profiles, tables are the other type of data product available in the ACS. Tables provide a precise or detailed view of a subject, and subject matter is the focus of the table. So the ACS has the following uh, types of, of, of tables, as you, see, you can see on the screen here in the bottom right. So detailed tables are the most detailed ACS data and cross-tabulated with different ACS variables. Supplemental tables are simplified tables that are available for certain smaller geographies. Then you have subject tables, and these are um, detailed ACS data classified by subject. And ranking tables, as the name implies, they provide state rankings of estimates across 89 key variables. And lastly, you have geographic comparison tables. These compare geographic areas such as states, counties, or congressional districts for certain variables. Ranking tables and geographic comparison tables are available through the FTP site, and they are also linked on the data page of the ACS section of census.gov. And so the image on the left here is of a subject table. It is an income subject table, so it has estimates of the population for given income ranges. Like the data profile I showed you in the previous slide, it is also available for many geographies across the US. Okay, so catering to a wide uh, variety of data users with unique needs, we have a variety of data access tools. This is a list of just a few of those tools, and I would, I would like to highlight uh, just a few of them. So first is data.census.gov. This is the Census Bureau's main data dissemination platform to access Census Bureau statistics. Next, I'd like to point out Quick Facts. This provides selected statistics for all states and counties and for cities and towns that have a population of 5,000 or more, and it combines ACS data, along with other Census Bureau data sets, such as our population estimates program, our county business patterns, building permit surveys, etc. And lastly, I would like to point out My Community Explorer. This is an interactive map-based tool that highlights demographic and socioeconomic data from the ACS, um, as well as other data sets. So all data tools are available from census.gov. If you choose the Explore Data tab from the ribbon at the top of the screen and then click on the Data Tools and Apps tab, you can see a comprehensive list of all of our census tools and apps. 
Um, and so just diving in um, a little bit deeper into a couple of these. So this is data.census.gov. It is the Census Bureau's main data dissemination platform. And it's the primary way to access uh, data from the ACS, the 2020 census, as well as other Census Bureau data sets. Data.census.gov allows users to filter searches uh, by through topics or geographies. It allows you to download data files and create customized maps. It includes ACS data from the 2010 to the present. There are also a variety of how-to manual, how-to materials, video tutorials, webinars, FAQs, um, and more to help you use data.census.gov. To learn more, please visit the links at the bottom of the slide. And this is Quick Facts. It is a quick and easy way to access facts about people, business, and geography. Quick Facts provides statistics for all states, counties, cities, and towns with a population of 5,000 or more. It's, excuse me, my cat's in the way. Um, it's great for making quick comparisons between two geographies. So just some of the topics you can compare on Quick Facts would be topics like population, age and sex, housing, health, economy, transportation, business, um, and others. And a, a nice feature about Quick Facts is you can select and compare up to five geographies at once. And with that, um, that concludes that portion of my presentation, and I will now turn it over to Dante. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, I'll jump in from here and uh, take over. Um, hi there. Um, my name is Dante Chinney. I am a director of the American Communities Project at Michigan State University. Let me see if I can get this shared to work here. I'm also a journalist at uh, NBC News and at the Wall Street Journal in Washington, D.C. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about uh, the American uh, Communities Project, which relies very heavily on the ACS uh, for the work it does, and, and really talk a little about what the ACP is, uh, why we did it, and, and how we use it in, in the reporting we do every day, both at NBC, at the Wall Street Journal, and at the project itself. And, and really talk about how journalists in general should, uh, the value of using data in your reporting and how it can really inform your reporting and make it stronger, make the work you're doing stronger. So uh, let's uh, jump right in. Um, I spent a lot of time working with data. Uh, I spent a lot of time working with data either at the journal or NBC or uh, I've often worked with data where I've, I've been a journalist for 30 plus years now. And a lot of times your editor or you will wanna to try to understand what's going on in the country by pulling out a data point. We just saw one today about um, what's happened with inflation rates in the country, how the inflation rates dropping. Um, the, the problem is these national numbers we we rely on, including things like national employment or unemployment, are, are they're not they're not useless. They're useful, but you need to disaggregate the figure to try to understand what's going on. So uh, what we're talking here is about how averages mask nuance and subtlety. So national unemployment in 2021, you can see overall was about 5.3 percent, but for whites it was lower, 4.7. It was quite a bit higher for uh, Black Americans and uh, in between for Hispanics. Um, median weekly earnings. Uh, you can talk about the national figure, which is $1,000 about, or was about $1,000 back in 2021. But you can see how that number really changes. If you can, if you can go get like an, a master's degree, if you can go that far, you can get an idea, your, the weekly earnings bump up to almost $2,000. Even a bachelor's will take up to $1,300. And if you have less than that, a high school diploma, it sits about $800. Life expectancy, even something, you know, is, as simple as, as life expectancy varies dramatically. I mean, the national average is about, was in 2019, was about 79 years, but it was over 80 in California, and it was just about 74 in Mississippi. So we need to get further into the data to go on, to go beyond just reporting a national figure, or a big national figure to try to actually understand what's happening. So when we do that as journalists, a lot of times we, we create these demographic groups. And I do this all the time still. I write off polls, so I spend a lot of time looking at numbers and trying to understand what's going on with these different groups that some of them we have pollsters have come up with, like soccer moms and NASCAR dads, and some are like numbers or groups that we look at, like Catholics or LGBT voters. And we 
take these groups, the, these voters, break them into these segments, and we try to understand them better. But, but the problem with doing that, at least in my opinion, is when you take these segments of the population and you remove them from the geography they're in, the place they live, you're masking a lot of things again. You're masking a lot of subtlety and nuance. So uh, the way I like to think of it is, you know, this is a 30 year old or a 32 year old college educated woman who lives in New York City, a white college educated woman lives in New York City. And this is a 30 year old white college educated woman who lives in rural Iowa. I will tell you, and you probably know this as a reporter yourself, if you go out there, these people are very different. They're, they're you know, they might have the same educational background and be the same age, but they have a very different lived experience. You know, there's a difference between living in Manhattan and living in Nebraska or Iowa or Michigan, where I'm from originally, these say, especially the rural parts of those places, that it can be a very different kind of place. So what we try to do with the American Communities Project, what we wanted to do was take this idea of disaggregating figures and data points and merging it with where people come from to try to understand their community to create a different way of looking at the country. And when we did that, we created a map that looks like this. This is the map we use to understand the country. And this is really powered by ACS data. ACS data is behind almost all the data in this map. Um, and what is this? This is 15 different types of county mapped using ACS data to try to understand different kinds of community in the country and how those people and places see the world differently from each other. That's what it looks like on a map. This is what it looks like if you were to just break it all down. Now, I can't do this kind of work myself. I'm just a stupid journalist, like a lot of you. Uh, I play with data, but I'm not, um, I'm not an expert in this stuff. But I worked with an academic, a professor at Michigan State University, at the Institute of Public Policy and Social Research, uh, Matt Grossman, who helped rebuild the typology with us. This is what it looks like when you see this map of all these colors broken into types. You can see there are real differences here. The big cities, there's only 48 of those counties. They jump out as a, as a, distinct, as a distinctive group. Only 48 counties, but they hold 81 million people. The African-American South, 272 counties, but only 13 million people. And then you go out to some of these places like the um, aging farmlands. 268 counties, you know, that's almost the same as the African-American South, but only about 1.1 million people. Uh, we have other groups in here trying to understand people who live in and around college, college communities, college towns. We have evangelical places. Now, religious data is not gathered by census. We, we had to work with PRRI and they had a huge county by county, county breakdown. Um, and we took that and, and added those elements in there. So we have things looking at evangelical population, uh, weekly church attendance, faith adherence. You can see later on, we have a group just for uh, LDS communities. There's only 39 of those counties, but there's 3.5 million people in there. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of this, uh, when I go through the, when we get to the end of the presentation. But you have groups for military communities, middle suburbs, which are kind of blue collar suburbs around, suburb, uh, around big cities. Rural Middle America, kind of big, big swath of America that's small town. I think really think of a small town America, working class country, which is kind of more blue collar and rural. And then the urban suburbs. A lot of people live in these places. There's only 112 of them, but there's more than 70 million people in those places. And they're located in and around, well, around the nation's largest cities. So how did we do this? We took 36, 36 different data points from the 3,100 counties in the country, most of this from the ACS, except from religion, and we used measuring uh, uh, standard deviations from the mean, and we had a computer cluster-like places. And again, I worked with an academic to do this, and I think that's something that a lot of journalists would need to do for this kind of heavy lifting, but like a lot of, lot of academics are happy to do this work for you. They find it interesting themselves. Some of the data points that went into there, Obviously, uh, race and ethnicity, um, whether people are married, percentage in the military, percent in college, manufacturing employment, median household income, family size, housing values, population density, and yes, religious affiliation. All those data points come together to create these 15 types. And with these 15 types, we see the country differently. Um, why does this matter? It matters because increasingly in the world today, in the United States anyway, self-segregation is really moving us into like-minded groups. Um, those people in those different groups, they live in different economies. They have different cultural norms at the community level, and it leads to very different perspectives of what's happening in the country. And then on top of all that, 
the rise of you know um, these things, these phones that we have in our pockets, as well as just good old fashioned niche marketing uh, and social media and digital media, has really accentuated those differences. You know, advertisers aren't stupid. They these things that we're seeing with the typology, they've been doing for a long time in different sorts of ways and trying to target messages to people. All that message targeting. All those different sorts of news outlets, media outlets, means that these people increasingly don't just live in different communities, they live in really different realities. And all those realities go into how voters see the country, how they vote, what they're going to do, how they're experiencing the economy. These things are important. And it's and what we're doing with the typology is trying to understand that stuff better. And again, all this ACS data sits behind all this work. Um, we recently received a big grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, and we are two big parts to it using this typology. One, we're conducting three big surveys, one each year around the ACP's 15 types to try to explore where the nation's divides are. I mean, we're all reading the paper and we see and, or watching television and seeing that and there are increasingly different views of what's happening in this country, different ideas about where the country should be going. We're trying to understand what's going on behind that with these surveys that will let us see in terms of kind of important cultural questions, socioeconomic questions, where, how people feel about different things, how they feel about the country, how they feel about the place they live. And we're gonna use those data to try to understand what's going on in the divisions that we see on these maps. And then the other thing we're gonna do is field work. So once we get all those surveys done, we are gonna look for the interesting stories in the data, which we'll be writing off of. And then we'll take those data and go out in the field and report. Like what something looks like in the data and what it looks like on the ground is often two different things. So as a journalist, that's where the more journalistic side of my work comes in. I have these data that, that show me what this map looks like. I have these survey data that show me how these different places see the world. And then I go out and see if what I see in the data and what I see in the map, what that looks like in the real world. And doing this, you see the world a very different in, in a very different way. And I'll explain a little later how this kind of work, it doesn't have to be the American Communities Project, but something you could do yourselves even, can help you do your reporting and really inform your reporting in a different sort of way. Um, one thing we have on the site is all these different ACS data sets we have. There are tons of them. We worked with the University of Wisconsin through something they have called the County Health Rankings, which is a wonderful site if you have a chance to check it out. And they've broken all these different data points into averages and means and medians for all these types. So on the screen right here, you'll see we have this thing on the website called the Data Clearinghouse. You can go in, click any number of these kind of different demographic divides, and it shows you uh, what it looks like in these communities. Not each one, they're obviously outliers. Some have more, some have less, but what the medians look like. So on the screen right here, you can see this is taking all that census data through the typology we have and trying to get an understand of people with the bachelors or more in all these types. And you can see, you know, the national figure is about 36%, I want to say, 35% right now. But like you get, you go to these urban suburbs, it's 42%. And then you go to some of these other communities, the numbers look very different. Working class country, 19%, Native American land, 16%, evangelical hub, 17%. These are just ways of understanding, aside from that big national number, what these differences look like at the community level. So, what do we do with all this? So you have all these different ways of looking at data and trying to understand these divides in the country and what the country's doing. Um, there are three big ways that we use all the work that we do with the ACS broken through the project that we have. For the most part, it's ACS data. Um, one is we use it directly on the site. So um, we, we write stories for the site, we write blog posts for the site, and we take things like this is below, this is voter turnout, in 2020 in all these types this is against census census data on voter turnout and we take it and we say like well what did turnout look like in each one of these different communities and it gives you a sense once you know the way these places voted okay well these are the republican areas and like here's what their turnout looked like and these are the heavily democratic areas and these are their turnout look like and it gives you a sense of kind of what the the playing field looks like in an election in a presidential election for 2020 Maybe what it tells you about what going forward to 2024, where both sides are going to be trying to kind of get voters more engaged, get them out to the polls. That's a direct way of using the data we do on the ACP site. Another thing we do, and I work with other 
organizations like NBC, uh, where I spent some time, is the ACP, the Amer American Communities Project, using that ACS data, helps us figure out how to do long-term projects. And in this case, we're not talking, we don't go on NBC and talk about like, oh, here's the American Communities Project, look at all the things it's doing, isn't this wonderful? What we're really doing is saying, we're using the American Communities Project to say like, okay, we wanna understand what different kinds of communities are doing going into this midterm election. Midterms are complicated, obviously, it depends on who candidates are, the economic situations, even from state to state can be different, but there, you can learn a lot through this. And this is what we did for the 2022 election at NBC, the midterm. We looked at Washoe County, which is kind of a suburban county. We looked at Dane County, Wisconsin, which is a college town. Uh, you know, it's where Madison is, University of Wisconsin, to look at what that part of the voting project population was doing. Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, which is what we called a middle suburb, uh, kind of a blue collar, um, not, not, definitely not poor, like true median middle, kind of middle of the road uh, community, but low, uh, lower than in, in general, lower than average uh, bachelors plus population those places. How are those voters responding to this? Maybe they're a little more sensitive to what's going on economically in the country. Um, Anson County, North Carolina, which is an African-American county, uh, kind of representing trying to see what's going on in the Black South um, and whether those voters were engaged and how they were thinking about the election. Delaware County, Ohio, which is an exurb, uh, it's uh, it's a place that's uh, outside of Columbus. Delaware's just out of Columbus. These exurbs tend to be better educated. Um, they tend to be a bit more uh, conservative politically. We just want to try to understand what those voters are doing. And then down to Chattooga County, Georgia, which was an evangelical hub. How are those voters responding to the candidates into the election? This is we did not say the American Communities Project. We did this work, but the ACP informed all the work we did behind this more subtly behind the scenes, and it'll do it again going forward in 2024. And then, and then the third way we use it in, in journalism and the work that I do anyway, is we use it behind the scenes really to spot trends. So this is a piece that I did at, uh, with the Wall Street Journal with Aaron Zittner, a colleague of mine there. And we took all the data from the decennial census actually to look at population changes. And we knew what the national fear was for population growth. And then through the uh, American Communities Project, we saw there was a specific kind of community that was rural that was growing faster than the nation is at large. Now that's not common. If you know data well, you know that like rural communities in general uh, are, don't grow faster than the nation, they tend to grow slower or some actually shrink. So we saw there was this trend in what was graying America in the American Communities Project, where we were seeing this growth. And on average, graying America was growing faster than the nation, which is surprising to us. And then we look closer at the data, we're like, you know, this is really a story about these kind of retirement communities that were that were resort communities. These are places where people went and they went on vacation and they fell in love with the place and they're getting older. This is a big baby boom story. And they're, they're deciding it's time to step away. And as they do, they're moving from cities and suburbs back out in these places. And uh, in this uh, particular uh, community, this is down by the Great Smoky Mountains um, in Sevier County, but it's also true. I'm from Michigan in Grand Traverse County, uh, up around Traverse City, Door County, um, Wisconsin, all sorts of these communities where there's kind of a draw, a lake, a mountain, some kind of resort community, and it brings these people back. This is a trend worth noting because these places are changing over time. Anyway, that is not reporting where we mentioned the American Communities Project specifically or heavily in the piece, but we saw the trend using this kind of breakdown of the data. And then you, you, put, you use it as a filter to analyze different bits of information and all of a sudden, you have a story and you have a story that other people don't have. And it's really the ACS sits behind all that kind of powering the work that we do. Um, so, you know, what's this really about for us? It's, you know, it's, look, the world is incredibly complicated right now. I'm trying to understand what's going on between what's happening in social media, the kind of splits in the party, the fishes in the car party. How do you, how do you understand what's going on? We think, the ACS data is, allows us, to, it's a sense maker for us to try to understand what we're seeing in the world and what we're starting to see in our interviews with people and our data in our data collection, our data reporting. Uh, the ACS data in particular, just the wide variety and array of topics they cover and the issues that they have, uh, the, the wide variety of topics they cover lets you explore a wide variety of issues. So it's a very powerful tool for that. In fact, it's Remarkable. Now, I will say for the, what we do at the county level, you have to use the five-year ACS data because you want to. We want to get everything for every county, including the smaller ones. But even in that five-year data, it's that five-year data is a goldmine. There's a lot of good stuff in there, and important. I think, 
when you start mucking around with data is combining data sets can really help you see uh, the story differently. So if you start to see something with um, maybe lower median household incomes, you start adding other data sets in, maybe something involving education, maybe something involving proximity to a major metropolitan area, and all of a sudden you see it differently. Anyway, these this using data in this way really helps you as a journalist, I think, do your job smarter and in a, in, a, in a better way, in my opinion. And with that, I guess we can move on and um, take some questions, but I think my, uh, Jewel and Ryan may have a few things to add before then. Yes. Yeah, we will hold uh, off on questions until the end. We just have a few more slides to get through. So, so. share. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you, Dante. Alrighty, so now I would like to share some resources uh, with you for learning more about the ACS. Um, a great resource to start with is the ACS main page, as shown here. It contains a wealth of information about the survey, data products, tools for data users, and other helpful information. This page can be found by going to census.gov, um, selecting surveys slash programs and then selecting ACS, or you can simply go to census.gov forward slash ACS. Um, additionally, we have a web page specifically designed for journalists called our Information for Media page. Uh, on this page, there is a handbook and a flyer designed to assist journalists in accessing and interpreting ACS data. You can check out this web page at the URL listed at the bottom of this slide, and it's also available via a QR code at the top of the slide. Once you're there, you can also check out our other handbooks if you're interested. And I want to highlight Census Reporter. This is a website designed to make ACS data more easily accessible. It is unaffiliated with the Census Bureau, though I want to point it out to you because it can be a great resource. You can search by places and topics and Census Reporter will pull all relevant ACS data tables. It also provides various kinds of data visualizations. Um, you can download the data in several different formats. And lastly, there are some tutorial videos on their website to assist you in learning how to navigate the site. The handbook I mentioned in the previous slide includes Census Reporter as one of its case studies of how journalists can access ACS data. So you can read about Census Reporter in that handbook as well. Additionally, we have a data gem or a short informational video about Census Reporter available uh, on our website. And that's the image you see on the right here. And the link is also there for that. Um, so if you're interested in Census Reporter, you can visit censusreporter.org and the URL is also on this slide. And if you would like to see recorded webinars of how to access or use ACS data, we have a web page for that. So this page is a great resource when looking for training on various subjects. And there are many webinars that are basic entry level uh, to help you get a good understanding of the content. You'll also find overviews of more advanced tools like the API and the public use um, microdata sample or POMS files. Feel free to check out our recorded webinar, webinars page at the link provided uh, to help expand your knowledge. Okay. And so as I begin to wrap up, I would like to invite you to stay in touch with us. If you use ACS for any of your news stories, we would love to hear about it through our Share Your Story section of the Census website. If you don't have a story, you can always browse some of the ways other people are using ACS data. Also, I invite you to join a group we have specifically for users of ACS data, known simply as the ACS Data Users Group. This group in, um, is, includes a website and an online community uh, that right now has about over 4,500 members, and on there you can share messages, materials, and announcements uh, related to the survey. So membership is free and it's open to all interested ACS data users. 
And finally, you can sign up for and manage email updates from the ACS. Our monthly events and updates email will alert you when new materials are available and you'll stay updated on our data releases. So you can visit the QR code under each icon to learn more about these resources. And here is a list of resources for connecting with us. Uh, media inquiries should be directed to our public information office. If you would like assistance accessing or interpreting ACS data, you can reach out to us through our non-media customer service line shown on the screen. Um, you can also connect with us um, by subscribing to our email alerts where we will share more information. Um, again, you can scan the QR codes um, on the screen. Oh, I apologize. There is not a QR code on the screen. Um, so yeah, here's a list of some of the common resources for accessing ACS data. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Jewel as we wrap up. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, so we are now ready to start taking questions. Um, we do ask that you use the raise hand feature when you would like to ask your question. Uh, before, When you get called on, please provide your name and your media outlet. Um, and because we want to give everyone an opportunity to ask their questions, we also we will allow just one question and one follow-up question per attendee. Um, if, unfortunately, you're unable to ask your question or have additional questions for follow-up, please send them to the Public Information Office, and you can do that either by email at pio at census.gov or by phone at 301-763-3030. So we'll give everyone a moment to get queued up for questions and then we'll get started. And I see we already have some questions, some raised hands. Um, so we'll take our first question from Sarah Dolezal. Sarah, please give your mic a second to um, be unmuted and then you can go ahead and introduce yourself and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, great. So this question is for Dante Chini. Is that, I don't, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that or. That's so good. I think I put it in the I put it in the, the Q and A, but I just will ask it over here. It's like, so I live in a college town that's in the American South, and we have a heavily um, African American population that gets overlooked often. So I'm just curious how you would approach, um, you know, kind of blending that together, where it's a college town where you're getting a lot of white wealthy people coming in, but then you have these locals that have been here for several generations that are getting pushed out, or um, there's graduate students that can't afford it anymore because of the luxury housing. So yeah. Like I said, I'm curious how you approach that uh, dichotomy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's, it's it's a really interesting question. In fact, you can argue there's some of the same problem with like the big cities where you have um, increasingly areas of intense wealth, uh, where you have very expensive home, very high home values, and then nearby a couple blocks away can have very low home values. I mean, so my answer is for the project. The point is all that is brought in, the, we're talking about the, the community. So that, that, that's all part of the community. So we focus on the community and we're pulling, we're pulling all the data out, like what does the unemployment look like in this community? What does the median household income look like in this community? However, for like the point you're talking about, because I think you're talking about Athens, right, Georgia. I mean, the, the, the thing that would be interesting for what you're talking about doing is obviously you can do it within Athens and take Athens apart. But the interesting thing would be to take other college towns and see how similar or dissimilar um, I think it's Rome County, is it Rome County, is from other college town counties in the country. That could be interesting. And the way to do it would be to um, go into the ACS, create a collection of college town counties you want to look at, and look at what are the differences, what, what's like the Gini coefficient look like in those communities. Uh, what does the median household income look like for bachelor's plus population versus population without a bachelor's degree? Or from what you're talking about through, through African-American population versus the white population in those communities. I think it's a really interesting idea to explore, and I think it's probably true for more than just uh, Athens, Georgia. I think those are interesting questions to explore in a lot of these college towns. For, for what we do, a lot of times we're focusing on the college town as a unit, but to take the college town units apart and try to explore the differences within them, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting idea. I'd take the ACS data and start pulling it apart by these different threads, pull apart by race, ethnicity, um, bachelor's plus, and start to see what you see in the data. I think it's a really interesting idea for a project. Thank you so much, Dante, and thank you for that question. Um, so our next question is going to come from Nancy Sobuleski, um, and I apologize if I said your last name incorrectly. Please give yourself a moment to be unmuted, and then you can introduce yourself with your affiliation and ask your question. Uh, 
Um, we had Nancy. I'm not sure what happened. Um, but for the sake of time, we'll keep moving. Um, and Nancy, if you can get your mic fixed uh, or figured out, we'll go up, come back to you. Um, so the next question is going to come from Aaron Joy Crossfield. Aaron, please give yourself a moment to be unmuted, and then we can, you can answer ask your question. Hand named raised. No questions here. Oh, okay. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, we'll keep it moving then. And our next question will come from Kurt Svetson. Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, I, I love this overall map and kind of how it shows the the diversity within certain states and then how other states are very similar. All the counties look the same color kind of thing. Um, and I guess my question, it's fairly basic. I'm kind of new to this census stuff, but um, it, uh, in one county, in Anne Arundel County in Maryland, for instance, um, it, there's a there is a lot of kind of what you just described in that college town community. There, there, I mean, and there's a report that gets it's been put out for thirty plus years, so called poverty amidst plenty, yeah, which is what's in our county. In our county, you know, right here we've got you know real areas, and and I, I'm wondering how. How how low can you go in terms of level of detail without getting into you know danger zones in terms of uh, just significance, margins of error, mm -hmm. and so forth. In terms of like if I look at there's four Puma areas that I could drill down on. There's something like fifteen or so census data places that, that I could use. You know, it, it, there's the tracks obviously too to break it down. But what, what are the? And I know it's kind of detailed, but just can you speak a little bit to to the the difficulties and and ways around that kind of so, challenge? So so I wonder when you get down to those levels, I wonder if that's even a better question for Ryan about terms like pitfalls in the data, because that stuff exists when you get down to really small levels, right? There's a question of margins of error um, and, and things like that. And he might be better for okay. answering that. But, but for me, I will say like when I, when I, um, what you're talking about, like, I like a lot of times I, I use Zictas sometimes just because zip codes are something people understand. Census blocks are very important. Census tracks are very important. And, and Puma is very important, but zip codes, people understand zip is usually aligned fairly well. And you, it's a way of trying to, in a way that resonates with people, um, mm -hmm. what the differences are within a community, I think sometimes, but, but I actually, I'm kind of curious to hear what Ryan would say about that, frankly. Oh, you're muted. There you go. Um, yeah, so in general, yeah, you're going to have um, lar larger margins of error at like smaller uh, geographic levels. So when you get down to Pumas are about 100,000 people. Um, when you get down to like Zictas, or even smaller um, census tracts and block groups obviously are, are much smaller. Uh, so they're going to have much larger margins of error. It's just more uncertainty in the data. Um, did, that, did that answer your question? Yeah, if I could ask one follow up. Um, it yeah. is there, I think that was allotted one follow up. <laughs> um, it, it, if, if there, if, if I love your helpfulness and all the videos and so forth, if there, if I were to do an analysis, put together an analysis where I've joined data and, and, you know, followed the, the guidance I've gotten from various guidebooks, watching videos and so forth. And I think I got it right, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> is there a, Play, do you guys like review? Is there a service or a place where, where I could say, hey, is there like, can you look at this and tell me if I've gone way wrong here? Uh, do you have that kind of review? Yeah, so we have a data user support um, email. Um, I mean, just like, hey, Ryan, I'm gonna chime in. This is Gretchen Gooding. I work with Ryan. So we do have a data user support area and we can help answer questions, but we don't really have the, the staff. The staffage yeah. to really view other people's projects, so that is a limitation to the support we can provide. The, the the one thing I would say that the caller that that I would recommend actually, uh, Kurt, is to um, I mean, if you're talking about Anne Arundel or you're in Maryland, 
Mm. Find somebody at the University of Maryland. Yeah. Because uh, see if there's an academic who would be willing to look over the work and maybe like kind of brainstorm with you on it. Because like they're they anyway that would be my suggestion. That's what I did. I mean, okay. the, they, 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 it's for getting, for getting kind of recognized and kind of noted in the work, they, they might be willing to work with you and, and just make sure, check all the um, boxes, make sure everything's okay. Cool. Thanks. Um, I did see that we have several more questions in Cuba. We are at time for the webinar. So I wanted to thank you all so much for attending and remind you that if you were unable to ask your question today, so please feel free to reach out to the Public Information Office, either by email at PIO at census.gov or by phone at 301-763-3030, and we'll be happy to address your questions. As if we wrap up, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, if it's anything for me, it's go to the AmericanCommunities.org site, and you can find email on there and email the project, and we can try to get something back to you. I'm happy to help. Thank you, Dante. And as we wrap up, um, I would like to remind you all to please subscribe to our media alerts in the newsroom. Uh, you also have the ability to uh, select specific news features for what you're interested in from 2020 census uh, releases to any of our other products. Um, you can also connect with us on social media. There are a variety of ways uh, to connect with us. I hope you explore these and choose the one um, that works best for you to stay in touch. Um, and finally, we ask you all to please fill out our evaluation form. We want to make sure that these sessions are helpful to you. Um, and we've already received some very helpful feedback. So we ask that you take a moment to fill this out um, and submit it in that way. Sorry, excuse me. Um, in that way, we can make these more tailored to your needs. Thank you again for joining today's Journalists in American Community Survey, uh, survey webinar. We'll see you again next time.